and welcome to Onsite at COP15 World Insight Special. I'm Tian Wei here in Kunming. This week, I will be here in this city known as China Spring City, bringing you all the latest from the ongoing UN Biodiversity Conference, attended by delegations from all over the world, both online and in person. COP15 starts Monday, and here's the latest we wrapped up for you from the just concluded opening ceremony. Once a polluted lake, it is now a showcase of the strong determination to protect the environment. Strolling along the Dianchi Lake in the city of Kunming, one could hardly imagine 10 years ago the lake water was green and stinking. But these pictures do speak for themselves. That change has been taken note by delegates attending the ongoing COP15 or UN Biodiversity Conference. They need inspirational case studies like that of the Dianchi Lake to rally the world and encourage confidence in reversing the trend of biodiversity loss. We need best practice sharing for sure, and we need science, and we need all kinds of innovations that not only supported by the government agencies, but also by involvement of all communities, including business, including education researchers, and including the private uh, companies so we can come together as a global communities so we can really share a future for all life on earth. Since the dawn of the industrial revolution, humans have viewed nature as a source to extract raw materials, energy, minerals, timber, you name it. In the last 50 years though, wildlife population have on average declined by 60 percent. Around one million animal and plant species, almost a quarter of the global total, are threatened with extinction. There were earlier attempts to solve the growing problem, but the deadline for goals set earlier were hardly met. So the five-day meeting is to set the stage again for a new global framework to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. The draft of the proposed new framework lists 21 targets for urgent actions. The main proposals protect at least 30 percent of land and of sea areas globally and increase funding to at least $200 billion per year on that. Now, delegates from all over the world are presenting their views at the ongoing COP15. What they realized together is even though there were progress being made earlier, there's no breakthrough. What they need now is both being ambitious and inclusive in setting the goals and even more importantly, actions and results. Tian Wei, CGTN, Kunming. The ongoing COP15 this week is only the first part of this crucial meeting. Due to the pandemic, the second part of COP15 is likely to be held next April. Then, 195 countries and the European Union are expected to adopt a new global framework to reverse biodiversity loss over the next two decades. So what are the priorities for making this framework a reality? How to ensure everyone pitches in? So what can China do to promote biodiversity? We gathered voices from different parts of the world and brought to you this discussion. For more on the Conference on Biodiversity, joining us in Washington, D.C., Wu Changhua, China Director of the Office of Jeremy Rifkin. In Texan, John Waynes, who is a professor at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology with the University of Arizona. In San Francisco, Peter Knights, founder and president of Wild Aid. Last but not least, in Vancouver, Kai Chen, professor at the Institute of Resources, Environment and Sustainability with the University of British Columbia. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to see all of you. We are gathered together for some very important topics about the latest situation on the global uh, debate on biodiversity. We know this conference has been postponed several times. How are we going to see, you know, what's going to take place uh, in China, in Kunming, related to uh, next April, coming April? Uh, how are these two conferences related? Uh, Mr. Knights. Well, I think I think the uh, the common understanding now is that everything, and it doesn't just not about biodiversity and climate change, and all these issues, but health as well. All these issues are integrated. You know, we have to deal with them all in one one uh, measure because we the things that threaten the environment and the climate also threaten health. 
and things that threaten things like deforestation, which are, are contributing to climate change, are also impacting biodiversity. So we have one major problem, which is that we're over-consuming and over-exploiting the planet's resources, and these things all need to be dealt with at the same right. time. Right. Uh, Professor Chen, of course, uh, earlier we understand that the conference was uh, uh, going to be in this sequence. Once is the conference on biodiversity, and then it's going to be the conference on uh, uh, climate change, but now we see it goes a little bit differently. So how should we see the sequence of development and commitments by global leaders and countries? Well, hopefully they'll go to the climate COP and they'll get into a spirit of collaboration and then they'll take that on with them to the biodiversity COP and, and actually really get to work on some global agreements about how we can confront these crises. As Peter said, that it's we've been dallying, really. We haven't been taking the kind of action that we need on either front, and it's time to get really started at that with, with some agreements that have yeah. some teeth. Yeah. Ms. Wu, uh, it is not just, uh, as uh, some of the other panelists have suggested, not just about biodiversity, but also about health. Uh, recently, we have been seeing this debate without vaccination, especially vaccination for the developing world. How would delegates be able to really gather together coming uh, April, uh, be able to really, really negotiate? As we know, it takes face-to-face -face discussions. That's a realistic challenge and a particular look at the inequality issue actually around the vaccination between developed and developing countries, they are very diverse, you know, and uh, uh, somehow hopefully uh, through the UN COVAC and other initiatives and the support a donation from many developed countries, as well as actually from emerging economies like China and others. So, you know, vaccination will become actually universal. Uh, so that everyone is better prepared when they come to Kuwait for the negotiation. Uh, the negotiation is critical in a way because, you know, we're talking about both the biodiversity losses and the climate change. Those are two, I call like a code red global challenges. And the timing is critical and mm -hmm. urgent. And we do need to get all the leaders, different, uh, you know, countries coming together right. and really reach agreement and come up with the solutions and acting together to attack those challenges. Mm. We understand that nobody is wasting the time uh, while the negotiations are so tough. Uh, tell me how much has been achieved even before the conference? There's been very few, if any, public commitments before any negotiations go on. I think, um, you know, we are at the time, as mentioned, we need some concrete commitments on the line now. And so far, there hasn't been many of those in either of those conferences. Mm. But we are at that ninth hour right now where we really need some concrete targets, some concrete goals and some accountability to actually get people to move this ball forward. Yeah. What are can, some of the... Can I jump in here? Please. I think if we're a cooperative team in particular, there has been a very significant effort globally. You know, China is the presidency of the COP, so Chinese government has making tremendous efforts of coordination and putting all the countries together. So there were three specific targets on the table that the process has been organized around. One, of course, is I would call like a halt, you know, or stop the loss of nature and biodiversity. And uh, by 2030, and uh, then by 2050, somehow we'll be able to recover and reach this uh, sort of a harmony between man and nature. That's uh, the number one goal. The second one is around the sustainable use of biodiversity, right? In, according to, you know, uh, including indigenous resources, genetic materials, stuff like that. And the third, actually, is really around uh, the fairness equity. Uh, around the use, right? Not only sustainable, we have to ensure the, the equality and the fairness issues there. So globally so far, uh, I think there were a few highlights still, you know, uh, until the agreement is reached at the very end of next April, we don't know yet. But throughout this process, there are some very positive, encouraging signs actually, or signposts there. This one particular around, uh, you know, 30%, 30% by 2030, is around like 30% of land and 30% of ocean uh, to be preserved or protected uh, leading up to 2030. Of course, the number will definitely go up leading up 2050. Uh, you know, if you look at the U.S., even the U.S., President, President Biden has committed, actually, at least from executive, from White House perspective, committed to this target. Uh, there are many more other countries moving towards that direction. I think, I think mm -hmm. China is pretty much on board as well. 
uh, I know the numbers are controversial in a way because people are asking, say, why not higher, right? So there are people talking about 50%, even let's say 80%. We'll see. Uh, negotiation is always a compromise process, but at least I think there are substances already on the table. But the 30% that we've been talking about land and sea, how did we come up with that number? Uh, what does that mean if we would be able to achieve that? Uh, Professor Chan. Yeah, I mean, it, it's there are a number of different areas of evidence that point to the 30 percent. But the truth is that there are also evidence, pieces of evidence that suggest that it should be higher mm. and that in a sense, the, the number itself is not what really matters, because what really matters is that outside of the protected areas, we are also managing biodiversity in, in a sustainable way. Right. Until we have that, it, even half is not enough because protected areas are not actually islands. They are subjected to forces that come from outside. So mm. it, it's going to take, in a sense, a whole Earth approach, not just a half Earth or a 30 percent of the Earth approach. Mm, that's cool. What about uh, from your perspective, Professor Wayne? So going uh, uh, with, what, with what Kai just said, you know, the, the problem with, with the climate change is that you can protect an area, right? You can make it a reserve or a national park, but that's not going to protect it from climate change, right? And, and so you could lose all the species in that park because of climate change. So that's why it has to be this whole, just as, as he was just saying, it has to be this whole very holistic view and and you know part of it is, is preserving the land preserving the sea but also it has to be stopping and or reversing climate change mm -hmm. otherwise the parks could be you know have just very limited biodiversity only a fraction of what they should have mm. there's a lot of talk about uh, make sure it is going to be a whole society and whole government approach uh, but how far are we really uh, ladies and gentlemen from there miss wu well, I think uh, definitely progress is on the ground already, and uh, and the distance remains far. Uh, if you look at the China practice, China today actually has about 25 percent uh, of its land uh, under something, some sort of a red line, ecological red line, uh, sort of regulation. And uh, then, of course, if you look at the U.S. and other parts of the world, historically we do have the sort of the, you know national parks, those all kinds of reserves, stuff like that. So there are foundations or bases like that in reality. Um, but ob obviously, the crisis we're in today tells us it's not adequate. And maybe something actually uh, fundamentally need to be reconsidered. Uh, uh, you know, what, what in, in order to protect biodiversity, it's not a, just a thing, some species, right? And mm -hmm. put them on the endangered list and then do certain things to protect them. But rather, nature is a whole system. We call it like ecosystems there. They are pretty much interlinked with each other. So back to the issue about this 30%, I don't think it's a totally science, uh, you know, solid one, but somehow it's a reference. There are some sciences in it, and that's why 30%. And more and more probably more on the practical side, but somehow, you know, besides of the planetary boundary side, mm -hmm. actually, then there's the other side, which is the people's well-being. People as a species live, live in the ecosystem. We had to make sure, you know, we, we, we survive right there as well. So it's a complicated in a way that that's going to require lots of thinking or reconsideration right. in terms of redesigning the policy framework with specific targets, milestones to be set in place. Uh, so that we're going to be moving up towards a more sustainable future. But today we do have to start somewhere. Mr. Knights. Well, it, the 30% is one thing, but as we just mentioned, you actually also have to implement it and enforce it. So drawing a line in the sand is great, but then it actually has to stick. So we work, for example, on marine reserves around the world. About 60% of the marine reserves in the world have no real practical enforcement. So they're a line on a map, but nobody's actually making sure that the protections that are supposed to be put in place are there. So it's a good start to designate this area, but we also then have to effectively protect it. And we also have to look after, as we've mentioned, the communities surrounding those areas, you know, and ensure that they have some kind of sustainable development in the future. One of the things is about timing. Um, 
we all know that different countries' economies are at different development stage, and that has been an argument uh, for the climate change issue, common but differentiated responsibilities. Now, for uh, biodiversity, one would argue it could also apply to such principle. Meanwhile, uh, the transition from one kind of uh, uh, doing business or uh, making a living uh, earlier through different generations of industrialization uh, pretty much started all from the West uh, to another very different lifestyle and production style. It, it would take quite some time for this transition, particularly for the developing countries. So how should we understand the importance that we are working for the better goals, but at the same time, we're not going to have enormous collateral damage on the road. So it has to be a balance, and obviously, we need sustainable development for people in poverty, uh, absolutely, which China has been so successful at bringing people out of poverty in the last few decades. But in some cases, it's been uh, at an environmental cost, which has to be paid at some point. So I think it's got to just be a, a balanced approach where, yes, we obviously need to bring people out of poverty, but at the same time, if they destroy the environment in the process, you may actually plunge them back into poverty. So you've got to take both these things in balance and account as you develop in, in, a, in a sensitive way to the environment. And I also think the richer countries have to help support those, those less wealthy nations um, in this process, because that's the equity issue that we have to address on climate change and everything else. The developed world made itself through creating climate change. And if we you know, expect you know, other people to move forward, then we need to help them in that process. So there's that equity issue, which is a very sticky one, but does need to be addressed about supporting the less wealthy nations in how they deal with both countering biodiversity loss and in, in countering climate change. Professor Chan. I agree completely with Peter. It's uh, from an ethical perspective, the more developed nations, have benefited from many years of colonization and from policies and, and from an economic global economic framework that has enabled them us to continue developing in a way that has seen the extraction of natural resources from many parts of the tropics from from less developed nations and and that has to that has to stop and it has to stop in relation to both climate and biodiversity loss so uh, absolutely it's part of the responsibilities of the richer nations to subsidize the transition the transformation towards sustainable economies it has mm. to be that way it has to be yeah. that way but it's easier said than done isn't it that that's absolutely. as we have been seeing you know, over the climate change debate, Ms. Wu. Yeah, besides what uh, Peter and Kari have said, I do want to add another perspective. Uh, I think one, you know, encouraging thing is that, uh, you know, this is a big data, age of big data, right? And there's tremendous, you know, amount of data coming out for us to understand. This is sort of developed versus developing countries around the biodiversity or nature or, na or ecosystem services there. And so now we know better than never in terms of the why, so the root causes mm. there. If you look at the deforestation, right, and uh, particularly Amazon, this one particular example, and uh, who are the major drivers, players uh, on that large, largest amount of national companies, right? And you have companies in the soybeans, you know, in the agricultural sectors, the food, uh, timber products besides that, and also mining there, of, of course. And the second major player sort of related to that actually is the financial institutions there, right? And so you started to, have, not just the governments actually, you have all those major corporate players who are pretty much the engine of our global economy and playing such a big role. Mm -hmm. You know, they are of course making money, tremendous amount of money. And to a certain extent, actually more and more companies are emphasizing their sort of corporate social responsibility or sustainability they started to pay more attention actually to local communities as well as biodiversity there. But we do have a historic record there, right? We know why we got to where we are today. So there is a sort of a common but differentiated responsibility element there. So besides multinational companies there, we do, or financial institutions, there are banks, stuff like that, uh, governments actually also need to take, mm. take actions because they are the regulators. They make laws, regulation standards. They have to make sure you know, actions like that wouldn't be allowed anymore, right? Mm. And so th this is going to require another level 
of collaboration you know, among countries, both developed and developing countries, but not only governments, but also corporate the world. One could argue nowadays it's even more challenging because of uh, uh, geopolitics uh, compared to years ago when the climate change debate was underway. It's becoming ever more complicated. Uh, Ms. Wu, what's your take on that? Will that make the governments more united on this issue? Will they compete for a good reason? Uh, that probably is an interesting question. Definitely. <laughs> it's a very difficult question as well. I think from science perspective, if you look at IPCC and also the Nobel Prize Award for Physics today, announced today, and more than ever, we know for sure that climate is changing. We know the reasons there. And for the solution part, it, it requires unprecedented global partnership, humanity mm. coming together to work with each other. But then in reality, the difficult situation, particularly between U.S. and China, this geopolitical rival saga is not helping at all. To a certain extent, I think somehow this needs to become a global debate. Mm -hmm. And we do need to require, demand actually, political leaders of two countries come just sit down together. And uh, you know, not only for the sake of their own countries, right. rivalry purposes, stuff like that, but really for the sake of the humanity, for the sustainability of the humanity. It's not only their obligations, responsibilities, but more so an opportunity because the, the two largest economies are, are big enough, are strong enough, powerful enough, who will be able to steer the whole mm. ship actually towards a different direction that's needed more urgently than ever. Right. Professor like Wayne. pull us back for a moment, actually, if we can, Please. to the point that um, Dr. Ms. Wu raised earlier about bringing bring companies into these conversations, right? Because in, in many nations, the, there's not a capacity to act if it is in direct opposition to the companies because there's so much power in these large multinational companies and there there are, you know uh, there's actually an international treaty the energy charter treaty that stands in the way of many nations taking aggressive climate action because companies can sue for damages associated with that aggressive climate action and so one of the key pieces that i hope will be on the table at the climate cop will be to move away to undo this energy charter treaty effectively in the context of climate action. Mm. Uh, Mr. Knight. I just want to go back to what we was said there, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. If the US and China lead this, the world will follow. It's as simple as that. If the US and China can forget their differences in other areas, which frankly are, are, are relatively small in the big picture of human survival on the planet, if the US and China can lead, the European Union, the other countries will come along. And so this is essential, you know, both in the biodiversity and the climate change. These are the key nations that can lead the world into a better and safer future. And yeah. my great hope is the leadership in both countries gets together and rallies the world around this. It's a huge opportunity. Mm. Uh, Wu Changhua, John Wayne, Peter Knights, and Kai Chen, thank you so much for being with us.